gather around, kids, it's time for a history lesson from old man Dave. You see, in the days before YouTube and wikis, sometimes the only way to figure out how to beat a video game was a strategy guide. Strategy guides were actual dead tree books that were sold in stores, and believe it or not, there was a huge market for them. Sometimes these books were complete detailed walkthroughs, sometimes they just had a small handful of hints, but very rarely did they transcend the strategy guide form to become something more elaborate and weirder, a work of art just as fun on its own as the game it describes. And on the other hand, sometimes you struck gold. Today, I'm geeking out over the King's Quest Companion. Dave's Obsession, Dave's Obsession of the Moment. Yes, it's no secret that I love Roberta Williams' King's Quest games. Despite all their weird and frustrating moments, the world of King Graham, Queen Balinese, Prince Alexander, and Princess Rosella is an endless source of fun and joy for me. And believe it or not, this strategy guide by Peter Spear gives me just as much fun and joy as the actual games in the series. Now, I know what you're thinking. And no, the King's Quest Companion is not to be confused with the official book of King's Quest. So just put that out of your mind, they're two completely different books. I know you totally knew about both of these books and were getting them mixed up. The official book of King's Quest has a fair bit of history of the development of the series, and it has maps and hints written in that King's Questy sense of humor. Some of the hints are particularly helpful, especially hints that tell you what is okay to ignore, and the more spoilery hints are provided in the way of crossword puzzles. It is a fun read for fans, completionists, and people who would like just a little nudge on puzzle solutions without being completely spoiled, but it doesn't have complete walkthroughs at all, let alone ones as wild as what the King's Quest Companion contains. The Companion, on the other hand, not only spoils every element of the games, it fleshes out the lore of the world of Daventry to a level that would make Tolkien say, dude, chill. It's the Grammarillion. This book was published by Osborne, which was the tech imprint of McGraw-Hill Publishing, which means that this is lumped aside, like, manuals for Microsoft Outlook. Osborne also published a Space Quest Companion, which I haven't read yet because I'm less immersed in the world of Space Quest, but I assume it's similar in nature to this, and I promise you the Sierra Companion series is far and away the most interesting thing ever to be released by Osborne. I first became aware of this book from the collection that made me aware of King's Quest in the first place, the 15th Anniversary Collection, which was gifted to my family alongside a hand-me-down computer from some relatives. Amid the many bonus features in the collection was an excerpt from the King's Quest Companion, which absolutely fascinated me. A few years later, I actually stumbled across a copy of the Companion in a used bookstore, alongside a copy of the official book of King's Quest. I guess somebody got over their King's Quest phase in a big way. But my parents said we could only buy one of the two books, and the official book was a bit cheaper, so that's when I got my copy of this, not when I got my copy of this. I didn't get my hands on the companion until years later as an adult, when I just sought out a semi-affordable used copy online. But when I finally did get my hands on the King's Quest Companion, the book was everything I wanted it to be and more. This is the fourth and final edition of the book, which covers everything up through King's Quest VII. Shockingly, they did not update this again for Mask of Eternity because that would require acknowledging the existence of Mask of Eternity. But this fourth edition is what we're going to be focusing on today. The theoretical selling point for a book like this is that it's a complete walkthrough of the games. Not just a hint book, but a solution book. The Read Me First section drops major spoilers for some of the more frustrating puzzles of the series, and then even throws a bit of shade at the other King's Quest book. But while that would be more than enough for most King's Quest players, this doesn't stop there. This is a walkthrough that's also a novelization. A novelization of the King's Quest games. And this is also not to be confused with the three King's Quest Expanded Universe novels, which also exist, but I've never managed to track down copies for myself. Those are stories that happen in between the games, but this book is the stories of the games. Every even-numbered chapter in the book is the story of a King's Quest game, telling the steps of a complete walkthrough in a narrative way. Now, the odd-numbered chapters are all expansions of the lore, much like the appendices at the end of Lord of the Rings. Except instead of being at the end, they're interwoven between the main chapters of the narrative, so I guess they're more like the supplemental bits between the chapters of Watchmen. Anyway, that's the basic overview of most of the chapters, and chapter one is something we'll get to in a little bit. 
Chapter 2 is the story of King's Quest 1, Quest for the Crown, as recorded by Daventry Royal Scribe Derek Carlevagan after Graham told it to him. Remember that name, Derek Carlevagan. It'll be important later. It is for others, at other times and places, to decide the reputation of the man we called, during his own time, King Edward the Benevolent. Elsewhere, we have recounted the stories of how he relinquished Merlin's Mirror, the Shield of Achilles, and the Chest of Gold. Elsewhere, in this case, being the King's Quest I instruction manual. Chapter 3 is an overview of the world of Daventry and its many neighboring kingdoms. This chapter purports that the oldest kingdom in this world is Serenia of King's Quest V fame, which might be a reference to the fact that Roberta's precursor to King's Quest was the Wizard and the Princess, aka Adventure in Serenia, so Serenia was quite literally the first of these kingdoms that Sierra created. Which doesn't explain why it's not mentioned at all in the pre-King's Quest V edition of the book, but hey. Chapter 4 is King's Quest II, Romancing the Throne, recounted by Graham's Prime Minister and Advisor Gerwain. I must confess, however, that I do not think it is proper for a monarch to go traipsing around the world by himself, questing in search of women and adventure. His duties are at home, near to his subjects. This is especially true if the king has no heirs, and Graham has none. I must also confess that I do not think it proper for a king to wed quickly without proper dowry or period of courtship. I do not think it proper that a king wed away from his own land, out of sight of his own subjects. I especially do not think it proper that a king marry without seeking the advice and approval of his own prime minister. Haha, <laughs> you haven't truly experienced King's Quest II until you've played it, knowing that an off-screen character thinks it shouldn't have even happened. Chapter 5 is an introduction to magic, as written by Prince Alexander after he escapes his captivity as Manan and Slave Gwydion. It's mostly here to present the spells from King's Quest III in case you lost your instruction manual, I suppose, but without interrupting the flow of the narrative proper of King's Quest III. Speaking of which, Chapter 6 is King's Quest III to air as human in the form of Carla Vagan interviewing Alexander about his story for a Daventry newspaper, which is especially useful in covering the looser structure of the beginning of the game. You see, if you haven't played King's Quest III, it's an interesting beast because much of the game is far more narratively linear than the first two, but the first act of the game is very meandering and repetitive, with Mananan sending you on randomly assigned chores and subjecting you to randomly assigned punishments. So this interview format allows the story to cover that sense of drudgery without having to linearly list all the things that can happen in the game and make canonical choices about what order chores were done in and detail all that tedium. Also, there is one point where the novelization makes it much more difficult on Gwydion than it is on the player. On the other hand, I had to get back up to the house with a cup of seawater in one hand and a thimbleful of dew in the other. I was fortunate in that my adventures hunting and gathering had not taken too long a time. It gave me the opportunity to inch up the slippery path with the extra care my burden needed. To anyone who might have been watching me making my snail's progress up the slope, I must have looked a comical sight. <laughs> yeah, in the gameplay proper, liquids in your inventory are just safe. This isn't any more challenging than walking up the path normally. It makes sense narratively, it works for the novelization, but it's not really effective as a walkthrough because it doesn't actually reflect gameplay, which is plenty challenging without this added element. Chapter 7 is a tourist guide to King's Quest IV's Haunted Mansion and the many graves of its graveyard. Chapter 8 is The Perils of Rosella, recounted by Queen Valenice after Rosella told her the story. I am Valenice of Colima, daughter of Cognis, who was a miller's daughter, and Cedric, a prince of that fair and tropic land. Yeah, this one was clearly written before Peter Spear learned that in the very next game, the name Cedric would have a very different connotation. My daughter loves books. She sometimes would rather read than eat or sleep, and this is a good habit that Graham and I have always encouraged. On her way through the parlor, Rosella spent a moment to look at the few books that remained in their abandonment. There was but one of any note, the complete works of Shakespeare, but it was one of her favorites. The Bard's works are rare but not unknown in our kingdom, and my daughter had taken to memorizing many of the better passages and reciting them with dramatic flair. Hey, at least Rosella sometimes stopped performing Shakespeare. There are certain people in Daventry I could name who just always seem to think they're reading from the Bard. Whence came this foul tempest? Chapter 9 is another guide to magic by Alexander, this time a guide to King's Quest V's Iconomancy, the magic transformation spells Graham is able to use without any words. This section goes into the history of each spell, and it attempts to subtly explain why the choices Graham makes in the end of the game are the correct one. Ricky Tiki Tavi is a most unusual name for a spell, as it seems to be nothing more than a somewhat pleasing sequence of sounds. 
So remember, Shakespeare canonically exists in the King's Quest universe, but Kipling? Completely unknown. We will get to that. Chapter 10 is Absence Makes the Heart Go Yonder, recorded by Carla Vagan for a different Daventry newspaper and split into parts for some reason. King's Quest V is certainly more linear than its predecessors, but it doesn't have, like, clearly defined act breaks, at least not ones that noticeably align with how the parts are split here. I don't know, maybe Derek was paid by the part. The last thing Crispin offered Graham was Cedric. Who, who, me? Cedric hooted. Don't do me any favors. Neither Graham nor Cedric approved of the idea. Now both of you get out of here before Mordak does something worse, Crispin commanded. He nearly shoved the two out of the house. Thank you, sir, for all your help, were the king's last words to the wizard. He was being polite. He didn't think Cedric would be useful at all. That is the most perceptive you have ever been, Graham! In fact, the King's Quest V novelization properly conveys not the Graham-Cedric relationship depicted by the game, but the relationship the player feels with Cedric by having them be pretty sarcastic and antagonistic to each other. To the point that when Cedric actually does give Graham a sliver of useful advice, in an exchange that's made up from whole cloth for the book, mind you, and an exchange that is not so much giving Graham advice as making a sarcastic comment that fuels Graham to get an idea on his own, the book has to clarify that when Graham says, Thanks for all your help. He does it without rancor. Seriously, by this point, if they didn't clarify that, I would assume it was sarcasm. Chapter 11 begins with a confession and an apology from Derek Carlevagan for lying about his knowledge of the land of the Green Isles, explaining that he visited it when he was young, wrote the guidebook, but promised never to share it with anyone. I'm just picturing Derek giving the YouTuber apology, claiming he didn't realize that respecting the Green Isles' privacy would get him canceled. Chapter 12 is Air Today Gone Tomorrow, once again recounted by Carla Begin, which is appropriate since it was the instruction manual for the game that solidified his place in the canon. In reality, this chapter was written by a guest writer, Eluki Besh Shahar, aka Rosemary Edgehill, a fantasy writer with a long career that I am completely unfamiliar with outside of this mini novelization of my favorite game of all time. To tell you the truth, my hands already itched to take a hold of the threads of Alexander's strange story and weave it into a strong and colorful shape. I really like that line because it's kind of a perfect metaphor for what these novelizations are going for. Taking all the random things that you do in these games and turning it into a cohesive narrative. Maybe with mixed results, but the effort is always admirable. Interestingly, Six takes more liberties with the source material than the earlier games, because not only is the dialogue very much not verbatim from the game, but several poems are completely different. I guess because Six was so dialogue heavy, without changing things up this would have been more of a transcription than a novelization. Also, it's not a complete walkthrough because it doesn't include every solution to the Cliffs of Logic, or, you know, the short path, but they're going for maximum points with these. Chapter 13 is an oddity because it's a summary of a note from Carla Vagan questioning the veracity of the following chapter, the account of King's Quest VII. Derek is mostly skeptical that Rosella would be so receptive to a romance from Edgar, but it reads like Peter Spear taking issue with Game 7, which is weird because he published the King's Quest VII stuff as its own book so people could buy it separately if they already owned an earlier edition of The Companion. So if he does have issue with King's Quest VII, it's weird that he gave everyone two chances to help them beat it. Chapter 14 is the apparently questionable King's Quest VII The Princeless Bride, as Valenice and Rosella take turns recounting it to Graham in an exchange that is being transcribed by an anonymous source, potentially a royal scribe. It's unlikely to be Carla Vagan again, because, again, he doesn't think that this really happened, and also because by this point in the narrative, he doesn't live in Daventry anymore. That's right, he has his own lore. We'll get to that. Also, this one's split into parts, but so is the game, so it's more understandable this time around. I had hardly arrived and begun to take stock of my situation when I saw a strange creature, something like a large rabbit with very long ears, but on its head were horns like those of an antelope. King Graham laughed heartily. Surely you imagined it. There could be no such animal in all of Daventry. Graham, you condescending douche nozzle, you fed cheese to a wand charger. Where do you get off making fun of anything your wife says she saw? I heard a voice behind me saying, Welcome, oh most wondrously beautiful of all princesses. Welcome to my kingdom. It was a pleasant, friendly voice, but when I turned around, imagine my surprise. The person who was speaking to me was a troll. A troll, said her father. Was it as hideous as the tales tell? Graham, you've met trolls before. What is wrong with you today? Now to get down beneath the deadfall where the cat had said King Otar was being held prisoner. 
It looked like I would have to dig, but I had nothing but my hands to dig with. Rosella, you have a shovel! A shovel you mentioned two pages earlier, right after getting the horn you're about to blow. I know the shovel doesn't work at this part of the game, but you did technically have something else to dig with. Has the whole royal family of Daventry gone senile? Or is this just an effect of the questionable candidacy for this story only? So yeah, that's most of the chapters. Each chapter also has some illustrations, which probably would have been mind-blowing in the first edition when our visual frame of reference for these characters were just blocks. And there are maps of the lands in each story, but these are artistic renderings, not specific screen layout maps you might get in another strategy guide. Again, it all feels like it's going for a very Tolkien-esque depiction of this fantasy world. So yeah, all that to say, each even-numbered chapter takes a walkthrough of the events a player has to do in each game, and then describes those events as a story the characters live through. But while the King's Quest games are certainly somewhat story-driven, and they got even more so over the course of the series, the early games aren't nearly as dialogue and character-driven as, say their competition's early games. Sierra's early games were largely inventory puzzles hung on a loose narrative framework, so relaying those puzzle solutions in narrative form can yield interesting results. Look, King's Quest fans are used to having to think outside the box for, let's say, creative solutions, so this series attracts a type. That type being people who will try literally anything to make something work. You know, creative types. Which might be why there are quite a number of King's Quest fan projects out there, particularly fan-made game remakes and fan-made sequels. This is a franchise that rewards creative thinking, or at the very least being able to reverse engineer some rather esoteric creative thinking, and this book it's an official product, but there is a lot of fanfic in its DNA. There are parts of the novelizations that are basically officially sanctioned fix-it fic, or at the very least, justify it fic. And since the King's Quest series was already basically fairy tale fanfic, it's the next logical step. But yeah, there's no way around it. There are quite a few illogical puzzles in the King's Quest games, so much of the book is spent bending over backwards trying to rationalize why characters make the choices the player has to make. And King's Quest 1 especially is not necessarily the most illogical of the games, but being so early in the medium, it can feel kind of directionless. So the novel makes a point of conjuring up some direction for Graham that tracks with the story as we know it from the instruction manual, but is still kind of made up out of whole cloth. The only leads to the missing treasures the young knight had to go on was slim. One, the dwarf who had taken the magic shield of Achilles had been seen disappearing into a hole in the ground. Two, the shape-changing witch who had stolen the chest of gold escaped on her broomstick into the clouds that clung to the peaks above Daventry, solid-seeming masses that looked like snow cornices, impossible outcroppings poised out from the mountains with no support. Three, the nameless sorcerer who had absconded with Merlin's mirror had said it would be kept in a safe place, guarded by some fearsome beast. There were no easy answers in the list, but that was all anyone knew about the mystery. Yeah, that's way more than the player knows about the mystery. Unless you've read this book, you don't have those hints while playing the game. Now, I applaud Spear for actually making a connection between which characters the manual claims stole each treasure and where the treasures are actually found in the game. It was a storytelling problem worthy of a King's Quest puzzle, with a solution that was even a little less forced than most. But it still gives Graham, the novel character, way more to go off of than Graham, the player character, has. In fact, there are multiple places where the character gets more clues than the player gets. Rumpelstiltskin not only says the word backward twice, he calls Graham, you alphabetical imbecile, which is about as forced as a hint can be. And Alexander finds etchings on the wall of the labyrinth that lay out his pathway, unlike we the players who just have to wander around aimlessly and save our games constantly before we fall into any bottomless pits. Now, when you're playing an adventure game, you have to try everything, no matter how little sense it would make for a real person to try it, and that includes picking up a lot of inventory items that no real human would want to carry around on a quest. So to rationalize that behavior, Peter Spear gives Graham a mantra that comes from his father. My daddy used to tell me, boy, if I've learned anything in my life, I have learned this. When in doubt or in trouble, pick up anything that is not nailed down, and if it is, check for loose nails or boards. Check carefully into, under, above, below, and behind things. Read everything, you might learn something. Wear clean undergarments, brush after meals, and always remember, nothing is as it appears. 
so you know, that's nice and clean. It gives Graham a personal reason for doing adventure game stuff all the time. And yet, despite giving the characters a verbalized commitment to picking up everything, some items the player has to collect are given additional motivation for their collection. Like the pebbles on the side of the river, which Graham picks up to appease the river gods as part of a Daventry tradition whose backstory involves some fools drowning on a raft made of pig's bladders? Creative. Some decisions the player character makes are even called out by the narrator of their particular story as being stupid things to do. They just happen to work. He had no weapons, and new words would do no good with either the wolves or the queen. He said that he hoped to distract or placate the beast when he began playing his harp. I for one find the action quite illogical, especially given the circumstance, but the king maintains that it was the only idea he could come up with at the time. And after all that, there were still some choices the player characters have to make that just couldn't be rationalized, or at least Peter Spear couldn't figure out how to rationalize them. So like any good fanfic you retcon, these choices were mistakes! So here are just a few things that the characters in the story did accidentally, even though the players of the games have to do them deliberately. Moving the rock to uncover the dagger, using the elvish ring, rubbing the lamp, bridling the snake, and dropping the gold ball. Also, Graham looks for the needle in the haystack because he tried taking a nap in it, and he reflexively throws the pie at the eddy because he happens to be holding it, even doubting himself afterward. Graham also falls in the water climbing down the well accidentally, but since it's possible for the player to do that accidentally, I'm gonna let that slide. And then there were some moments where Graham's desperation just matches the player's desperation. Maybe odorous old cheese is what powers it, he mumbled. It most certainly smells that way, and stranger things have happened in this adventure of mine. Now, you may be aware that several puzzles in the King's Quest series have multiple alternate solutions. And the stories here describe the actions required to get the maximum number of points. But in the pros, the alternate solutions are often addressed as an option the character considered, and any items used exclusively in alternate solutions are mentioned in the text as being collected by the character, they just don't get used. I guess the opposite of a Chekhov's gun is a Roberta's slingshot. There are also a couple of moments where they try to work the functions of gameplay into the reality of the story, like giving Mananan a magical clock that Gwydion uses to track the time the way the player tracks the time from the header bar, or mentioning that Kalima is placed under a spell of containment which causes it to cycle back around itself, which is a weird thing to mention because this is true of each of the first four games, but only with Kalima did they make it part of the story's reality. And the Iconomancy passage turns game function into fiction by having Alexander coin the phrase click, as in the magician clicks on the spell in his mind. I'm pointing, I'm clicking, it's like an adventure! So all in all, these novelization chapters are purporting to be the true events, what really happened, which is a bold move for any kind of fanfic, even authorized fanfic. The cockiness of a spin-off claiming to be the real version of the story while the version it's spun off from is just an interpretation is usually reserved for television adaptations of hit 80s comedies, or feature film retcons of a 90s animated character source material. But the book treating only itself as canon and the games as interpretations is useful for consistency, and useful for explaining away story beats that just can't be squared. Like how Alexander's dear friend Derek has spent time in the Land of the Green Isles and wrote a guidebook which is essential to victory, a guidebook Alex thanks Derek for in this book, despite Alex claiming in the opening cutscene of the game that nobody's even heard of the Land of the Green Isles. Still the best game ever made, though. So with all the effort made to offer mostly complete walkthroughs of the game and try as hard as possible to make them make sense as a story, you would think that the last thing this book would want to do is just provide straightforward instructions. And yet, the last several chapters of the book are called The Easy Way Out. The Easy Way. And while they still contain some of Peter Spears' humor, commentary, and editorializing, they are just straight walkthroughs, telling you every step and every alternate solution, alongside a list of every point you can get in each game, and maps that are less artistic descriptions and more of those just charts of each screen that I mentioned you'd expect from a book like this. Again, these were the days before you just Google that information. I'm just imagining the person who just wanted a simple walkthrough and someone told them this book has King's Quest walkthroughs, and so they read through everything else, all the prose and the lore and bizarre little flourishes just trying to find their puzzle solutions, and then after all that they realize these are here at the end. The Easy Way Out chapters also point out some of the easter eggs you can find in the games that don't affect the story or the gameplay. 
Note, there is a bottle floating around in the whale's belly. If you get the bottle, get the note and read it. You might be amused. Then again, you might not. Some people find plugs amusing. And those people are comedy bang bang listeners. Side note, the easy way out reinforces the idea that the spell of containment happened in Colima, but it goes out of its way to mention that it wasn't true of Daventry, that it's only a gameplay function there. I have zero idea why. Also, Peter seems to nitpick a lot of elements of King's Quest VII in its Easy Way Out chapter, adding to the idea that he really seems to have a grudge against King's Quest VII. Again, very bold of this adaptation to not only consider itself the real version of all these stories, but also give itself an out to consider an entire one of these stories non-canonical. But mostly this book doesn't subtract lore, it adds it. Throughout all of the chapters, both the main stories and the supplemental chapters, there are a lot of little touches of lore additions, such as giving names to characters and objects left nameless in the games. And appropriately for King's Quest style of remixing existing stories, many of these names are corny pop culture puns. For instance, we know from the game that the bookseller on the Isle of the Crown is named Ali, but the book tells us that the pawn shop owner is named Hakim. So put them together and you've got an Oklahoma reference, baby. We also learned from the book that the minstrel in Tamir is named Frankie of Avalon, and the town in Ludor is named Port Bruce with a newspaper called The Bruce Banner. There's also mention of a friend of Graham's named Sir David of Bruce, which might be a reference to Banner's television name. And very appropriately, the beast true name is revealed to be Prince Cocteau. I don't know if these names come from Sierra's notes, or if they're Peter Spears' invention, but either way, they are properly corny for King's Quest. Beyond character and location names, there are also additional pieces of lore casually dropped that are plausible, but don't seem to come from the games themselves, like how the gnome in King's Quest V is suggested to be the same one in King's Quest I and III, or the casual mention that Hagatha is Mananan and Mordak's sister. The only game I've seen mention that piece of trivia is King's Questions. There's also a nice little note when Frankie of Avalon plays Greensleeves that it was the anthem of Graham's Court. A nice nod to the fact that it's the theme music of the first two games. And there's a running gag about the inhabitants of Daventry's distrust of technology. Several times over, nobody in this universe likes the idea of technology. It's possible this is another bit of a Tolkien homage, what with his vilifying of the machine. But it's also very likely that this is just a deliberately ironic joke about how a franchise that was built on pushing the boundaries of technology would center around characters terrified of that idea. So all that seems like a lot, right? More than enough, in fact? A unique walkthrough format and an expansion of the lore of the games? They certainly didn't have to go this extra with this, but you can see why I found this book so fascinating, right? A weird oddity that serves as a history, encyclopedia, and complete narrative of this fictional world from this specific esoteric fandom? Yeah, that's all a lot. Boy, this is a crazy book, isn't it? Would you believe me if I told you that we haven't gotten to the weird part yet? Nothing I've mentioned so far could prepare you for the most baffling element of this book. The part that's just eight steps beyond what anybody could possibly have asked for in a book they just got to tell them the way out of Mordak's dungeon. The single most inexplicable thing about this book, and the thing that for me shoots it into the stratosphere as a must read, is the framing device. Let's go back to that read me first part. Like I said, without warning it drops solutions to some of the more frequently asked puzzles from the games, and then with even less warning, it springs this on you. Oh, Daventry is a real place. I hope that got your attention. Then we get to the introduction, which is appropriately cheesily melodramatic for a King's Quest related work, as Spear waxes philosophical about rational explanations and scientific inquiry, and about how he was doing serious work about famine in Ethiopia. That warranted a mention in a King's Quest walkthrough book. Peter Spear made his own life and career an essential piece of the narrative here. I've written myself into my screenplay. That's kind of weird, huh? Spear talks about when he first discovered King's Quest, and when he met Roberta Williams, and how she hinted that her games may be more than just fiction. It's all real. Oh my god, I knew it. I knew it! I knew it! He also mentions that she did not come out right and say that, just that he read it into the way she talked about the games, which makes him sound just as potentially delusional as it makes her sound. Then he describes getting emails from Daventry, emails that contain most of the contents of this book. 
He describes suspecting hackers or pranksters of setting him up, but the deeper he digs, the more real it all seems. Derek Carla Vegan emailed these stories to Peter Spear from Daventry, and Spear collected them into the various editions of this book. That's right, in addition to having way more lore for Daventry than anyone asked for, this book has overly complicated lore about its own existence. Spear doesn't definitively say whether Roberta also received these emails or if she just dreamed of these stories. The book posits that our universes are so close to each other that we sometimes dream of each other. So maybe Graham's adventures came to Roberta in her dreams, Andrew Lloyd Webber style. You're, you're, you're a guy who is a dreamer, I would say. You're yes. a guy who uh, has well, a lot of ideas. Uh, you know, I do my work in dreams. Oh, really? I yes, that's that. how I write my musicals. They called me a fool when I said I could get two comedy Bang Bang references in a King's Quest video, but who's the fool now? But either way, whether Roberta read Graham's stories or merely dreamed them, the conceit of this book is that Roberta Williams is not actually a creative game designer who came up with puzzles and remixed fairy tale lore, but instead she's just making games based on things that happened in another dimension. It's an entire book of that Onion George Lucas editorial. And at no point is the pretense dropped. Even in the acknowledgments at the very beginning, Derek is casually thanked amidst the real people who made the book possible. That is total commitment to the concept. So at long last, it's time to talk about the part of this book that was teased in the 15th anniversary King's Quest collection, the part of this book that intrigued me so and made me want to track it down for so long. It's finally time to talk about chapter one of this book. Chapter one is called The Eye Between the Worlds, and it is a greeting from Derek Carla Vagan explaining the world of Daventry and how he started to reach out to Earth. We here in Daventry are your own descendants, the sons of your sons and the daughters of your daughters from generations and centuries back. And that's just the human folk. We are also your dreams and nightmares, your myths, legends, and stories. We are the reality that much of humanity has rejected over time. The unicorns, centaurs, and demigods. We are the other races of beings who evolved alongside humanity. The dwarfs, elves, gnomes, giants, and fairies. We are the users of the magic that you say does not and cannot exist. We are the truth behind what you dismiss as mere legend. And we are the flesh that became your fairy tales. We are the champions, my friend. We're the kids in America, whoa. We are, we are the youth of the nation. We are the very model of a modern major general. Once you could see the other creatures that shared your world, once you too could create ointments of invisibility, once you too could talk with the animals, and they would talk back, and once you too could mount a winged horse and fight the dragons of the earth. Now you say that if you cannot see, feel, touch, hold, measure, dissect, count, smell, taste, deduce, or duplicate something, it cannot be real. If you cannot find its bones, it never existed. You see yourselves as the center of the universe, the focus of all creation, and you see that it is good. Okay, I didn't come to a video game hint book to be ego shamed. So basically, our world, the real world, is the original reality, and once magical creatures lived here too. But as the world grew more and more skeptical of magic, all the magical creatures bandied together to create a new world elsewhere in the multiverse, where magical creatures and humans alike would be safe to thrive in harmony. The verb that the book uses is withdrew. The magical creatures withdrew from our universe into their own. It's not just another reality all its own, it's like a spin-off of our reality. It's our Frasier. As far as I can tell, I think this is meant to explain why, despite having a completely different world from Earth, stories familiar to Earth exist in the King's Quest universe. Did characters like Little Red Riding Hood exist on Earth and then withdraw, but we passed down our memories of them? Or were they born in the Daventry dimension and our storytellers dreamed of them? The book doesn't lay it out on a case-by-case -case basis, so I guess it's up to you to decide. But we do know Shakespeare existed in our world, no matter what Roland Emmerich may say, so I guess someone who withdrew just took a couple copies of his complete works with them. But no copies of Kipling! Where those first folk went and where I live now is as real and solid as your world, the one we call the Other World. It exists as just one universe amid infinite others in the greater reality of, for want of a better name, 
the multiverse. That's right. This book about computer games based on fairy tales was decades ahead of Hollywood trying to hop on the multiverse trend. It's everything everywhere all at once upon a time. Daventry exists just over your shoulder. If you could only turn around fast enough to see it. So then Derek gets into his own story. He moved into Mananan's house sometime after King's Quest III to try and learn more, and he discovered something in Mananan's study which he calls an eye between the worlds. It's a computer. He found a computer in Mananan's study. On this computer, he found the King's Quest games, he realized that in our world, King's Quest is a fantasy entertainment, and he decided to try and figure out how to send our world the true tales of Daventry. So basically, this entire book hinges on Mananan having a computer on his bookshelf. Spear even draws attention to what he thinks the computer is in the easy way out for King's Quest 3. The chapter that's supposed to be a straightforward walkthrough for the third game takes a moment in the middle of its walkthrough to point out what at best is an easter egg of a computer to fuel the book's own meta-narrative. Here's the thing. I have no idea what Peter's referring to there. He just says, on the bookshelf. What on the bookshelf is supposed to be a computer monitor? They all just look like boxes, so I assume they're all books. It's possible that this entire book hinges on a guy reading way too much into the shape of a pixelated box. Again, nothing about this needed to go this extra. But I am so glad it did. Also, I guess if Roberta made the games before Derek started sending these emails, I guess that answers the question. Roberta wasn't getting emails from Daventry, she was just dreaming of Daventry. Unless she was getting emails from someone else. Oh my god, is Roberta Williams in league with Mananan? That would explain why she keeps trying to kill us. Peter also provides evidence that these messages are real by mentioning in the introduction that in the first edition, Derek speculated that Mananan was plotting his revenge, long before Roberta started writing King's Quest V, centering on said revenge. Of course, Derek now speculates in Chapter 10 that Mananan may be plotting further revenge, and that was never followed up on, so... Checkmate Atheists? Also, probably not the best evidence to mention the first edition of this book, which makes no mention of Serenia, despite all the post-King's Quest V editions claiming it's the oldest land here. Anyway, the meta-narrative continues to get pushed in the second half of Chapter 11, after Derek's confession about his lies regarding the land of the Green Isles, Spear writes that Eluki Bey Shahar reached out to him saying that she received the King's Quest VI novelization from Derek, despite her claiming that she had never even heard of King's Quest, and Jane Jensen received the guidebook to the Land of the Green Isles from Derek, just to further push this mysterious narrative of messages from another world. Finally, Chapter 13, which I said seemed to be Spear editorializing about King's Quest VII, Spear reports on Derek's skepticism of the story, but also Derek's theory that potentially this is a fiction in his world based on the fiction in our world. That our worlds have begun to influence each other. And the fiction that came from Roberta's dreaming of Daventry has now led to a fiction within Daventry of a Daventry writer dreaming of Sierra Online. What? Despite my wisecrack at the beginning of this video roughly three hours ago, I really wish another edition of this had been published. I would love to see how much wilder this would have gotten once Peter incorporated Mask of Eternity. Reportedly, he was working on it, but he didn't get very far before the publisher cancelled the fifth edition. And now that the King's Quest universe has been completely rebooted, a continuation of this version of the world is sadly unlikely. Unless, of course, it continues that weird thread Derek was going on of his world dreaming of our world's dreams of his world, and it was like a fiction within the fiction within the fiction within the fake reality of this fake story. Oh my god, I want them to keep updating this book. But as it stands, this book is a wonderful, bizarre, inexplicable delight. It is truly worth reading, even if you've never played a King's Quest. In fact, for some of the games, reading the book might be the ideal way to experience the story. It's messy, confusing, sometimes trying too hard, sometimes frustrating, and a whole lot of fun, just like the games. And I highly recommend you track it down. Physical copies are still not impossible to find, but they may not be cheap. But fortunately, as of this recording, a website called the Museum of Computer Adventure Game History has PDFs of the first three editions of the book, and I was able to find a PDF of the 4th edition on Google, and I've got all those links in the description for you. 
So, have you read The King's Quest Companion? What did you think of it? What was your favorite part of it? What did you think the most inexplicable thing about it was? And if you haven't read it yet, give it a read, it's completely awesome. And if you enjoyed this video, you may enjoy my other videos about adventure games, or you may enjoy some videos about some other things I obsessed about during other moments. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.